Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I'm recording this one uh, from one of the few states that will accept people from Texas, uh, North Carolina, where, where I happen to have a house and, and a wife. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's fun to be here. I've decided to take a week off, as I told everybody else. Take some time off. I'm taking a week working from North Carolina. So this is from my library, and uh, thought I'd take the this week the opportunity to answer a lot of the questions. As you know, I've been asking you to send in a lot of questions, and you've been sending in a lot of questions. So I thought it'd be a great time to take an opportunity to at least try and uh, uh, answer them as best I can. So the first question that came in is, where did this virus come from? And uh, this is a hotly debated topic. It's become political, as you know. Uh, the president calls it the Chinese virus, and people are trying to figure out, is it from a, a, you know, a, a weapons laboratory? Is it from the Wuhan Institute? So this, this uh, early on was uh, looked at by Joe Petrosino's group. And COVID-19 is homologous uh, to other bat coronavirus that was isolated in 2013. It's 96% homologous to that 2013 virus from the wild. The only difference is the receptor binding motif, uh, which was not, not really similar to that one. And what uh, Joe's group did was look at other uh, um, homologies in the, in the animal world. And we found was that it was very similar to uh, a, a receptor binding motif in another coronavirus isolated from the Malayan pangolin. And it had 90% uh, nucleotide homology, but a 98% amino acid homology. And so that pretty clearly suggests that there was a recept that there, this was a recombination event that happened in an intermediate species, uh, and the pangolin being the intermediate uh, species. As you know, that's fairly common. SARS emerged from uh, civets, which are cats, and MERS uh, emerged from camels. They were both coronaviruses that had a, a recombination event in another species and became infectious. Now, um, this issue, was it made in the laboratory? Well, the Wuhan Institute is a BSL-4 facility that is very similar to the Galveston National Laboratory at UTMB. And not only is it similar, they actually do a lot of collaboration. They're one of the best coronavirus uh, facilities in the world. And their main focus is isolating coronaviruses from horseshoe bats, which are uh, very common in, uh, in Asia. And it's interesting, there are a million people who live very close uh, proximity to horseshoe bats. Uh, and, uh, if you, and they have been looking at surveillance of these people for a long time, and about 10% of the people have antibodies to some of these coronaviruses that are in horseshoe bats. But it hasn't been the result, it hasn't resulted in a wild infectious uh, spread like, like COVID-19. Uh, and so most likely uh, what happens is these viruses aren't transmissible in the population. They infect people locally and they get antibodies to them and get, get over it. But it doesn't start a, a global pandemic. It required a, an acquisition of that receptor binding motif, which was in the pangolin that become wildly infectious uh, 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 for uh, humans. And that's, that seems to be the data for why it's happened. Blaming it on the Wuhan Institute is a little bit like blaming uh, Baylor College of Medicine or UTMB because we study these viruses. Be like blaming us for Chagas disease or dengue or Zika. It just doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to me, but it's become political. But the fact of the matter is, started in a horseshoe bat, likely had a recombination with the coronavirus in, uh, uh, in the pangolin, and that's what became uh, infectious in the, and the pandemic that we're now suffering from. Um, there was a paper uh, in Cell just recently that looked at uh, uh, the, the, the different strains of coronavirus uh, and what this particular strain is. And people, there was a, a headline in, uh, in one of the newspapers that, you know, Houston has got this very, you know, infectious virus that really is different. Well, that's not true. So the coronavirus is an RNA virus and the RNA polymerase. Imagine if you're a typist, but really bad. And when it replicates uh, the RNA, it, it does a very bad job. Of it's, it's not very uh, uh, 
consistent and, and, and it often will have substitutions. And the vast majority of the substitutions that occur are detrimental to the virus, the vast majority. So the virus, the, those mistakes end up meaning that the virus doesn't do well. But occasionally there is a mutation that allows it to be a little bit more infectious. Uh, and the paper in cells showed that uh, the mutation that happened from the Chinese virus and that was responsible for the European variant allowed stabilization of the spike protein. And so there are more spike proteins and they're more stable on the cell surface. And that probably leads it to be more infectious, a little bit more easily to spread from person to person. The virus we have in the United States and in Houston is that European virus. We know that. The, the original virus in Wuhan changed pretty quickly and became a different virus. There was a variant there that spread throughout China, and that was the dominant strain. Now, one of the things about becoming a dominant strain in China, it may have been that it's slightly more infectious, or it might have been that a person spread it around a lot more and just sort of diluted out the original strain. So this variant in China had acquired, a, there was another variation that led to the European strain, and that's the one we have uh, in the U.S. So if you look back on it, closing the border to, for travel from China was fine, but three million Europeans came through New York in that period of time uh, until we figured it out, and that's why New York was totally overwhelmed with this European variant. So that, to me, uh, it, by the way, it should not really impact our ability to create a vaccine because the, the, the spike protein is still very, uh, is still the same. And if you have an antibody for the spike protein, it should work as a vaccine. Uh, a lot of questions came in about what are the major risk factors. Uh, and uh, so right now, it looks like you're three times more likely to, to be infected with COVID-19 if you're uh, in the black or Hispanic community, and you're two times more likely to die from the disease. There have been some uh, GWAS studies that show genome-wide association of the ABO uh, blood groups, and that's probably true. There are some genetic variants that lead to, to people to be more susceptible, but the diseases that are clearly that make you more susceptible are obesity, hypertension, kidney and heart disease and diabetes. These are the, the factors that are consistently found uh, for people to have a significant morbidity and mortality. Uh, and some people asked about what is the age distribution? Uh, and this is a more complicated uh, question. Uh, there's no question that more young people are being infected. And if you look at the admitted patients, uh, in most across the state and across the country, there's been a drop uh, in in the age by about 10 to 15 years. Uh, if you look at the Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center data, it's interesting in that the emergency room visits have really become mostly younger people, but the admissions continue to be uh, older folks. And uh, the majority of admissions in our Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center continue to be in that over 50 range. And so it's not really uh, all that clear. Part of that might be that they're getting, we're a hub hospital for a 17 hospital network, and we may be getting transfers of some of the uh, older patients who are sicker uh, to our Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. Um, one interesting thing is at Ben Town, however, the median age has dropped about 10 years, and that's kind of the national data that it's getting uh, younger. And early on, you know, mostly it was sniffles and little kids, but I spoke with Gordon Schutze, who's the interim chair of pediatrics at uh, Texas Children's, and the, te the census at TCH has been rising, and it's now around 30 patients. Mostly, as I mentioned, it was young kids with a few symptoms. There were about seven patients who were over the age of 20, but the big new thing, most of the new admissions are obese teenagers, uh, who often need uh, CPAP or uh, positive pressure uh, assisted uh, airway uh, management. So it is changing. Obese teenagers are really getting beginning to have a problem. And so uh, that is uh, that has changed in, in, um, in at uh, Texas Children's. The uh, R number is the infection rate. And it's very much dependent upon new infections, but also things we can do like putting a mass and distancing 
So it's the, it's the R value of one means, as I mentioned last week, one person, I infect one person. If I, R value of two, I infect two people. And the idea is to keep the R value under one, and that will lead to the, 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 the decline in the number of infections. Uh, so over, when we first started this process, the, the, right in the beginning, the R value of, of this particular uh, disease in Harris County was between two and three, which is really bad. I mean, that's logarithmic growth. That's uh, infecting three people, two to three people for every person. And that's when the, it was totally out of control. Uh, in the last month or two, we've been uh, hovering at about 1.4, 1.5, and I mentioned last week we were at 1.5. Over the past four to five days, the number has dropped consistently below one, and that's really good news. And that is also consistent with the fact that our new our new case numbers uh, have plateaued. And so, there the, the best news of, of, of all actually is that the, the things we've done including uh, focusing on masks and uh, spatial and, and social distancing is working. And that is the one thing we need to take from this is that works and it can get the R value less than one. And when that happens, we'll begin to see a decline uh, in the rest of the community. Um, I had another question on how does the Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center uh, admission data compared to the rest of the TMC data. And it's very similar. Uh, the percent of ad, a percentage of admissions that are COVID positive has been about 20% of Baylor, Baylor St. Luke's Medi Medical Center. And it's gone from about 20 to about 25%. And that is consistent with, um, uh, with, with uh, the rest of the medical center. Um, Another question was, what percentage of COVID patients are admitted to the ICU, and has that changed? And I'd say bef the data are before May 28th, about 57% of patients admitted ended up in the ICU, and that has dropped pretty dramatically to 35%. And the other thing is the length of stay has dropped dramatically from somewhere around 15 days to five days. Uh, the only problem is that because there are more and more cases, our ICU bed occupancy is going up for, for COVID patients. And now about half the patients in our ICU uh, are COVID positive. And while our census of COVID patients has increased in the ICUs, the use of ventilators has dropped from 50% to, to about 15%. So uh, that's a pretty dr that is a pretty dramatic improvement going from 50 to 15 percent and it's better airway management the prone position a lot of the uh, the meds that we have uh, remdesivir has actually really been helpful so there's a lot of uh, improvement in the way we're managing these these patients uh, there is a question about what's the overall length of stay uh, and uh, again it has dropped pretty dramatically at Baylor St. Luke's from about uh, 15 days to five days and at Bentob, it's dropped from 10 days to five days. So again, significant improvement in our ability to manage these patients. So I, I mentioned to you before that uh, you know my daughter-in-law uh, is a middle school teacher and she's had to deal with kids all summer long. So uh, she decided to uh, talk to uh, my dog, Lily, and her buddy, Leo, and, and see whether or not there were some uh, recommendations for how to stay safe in the summer. So uh, we have a little video at the end that is uh, advice from Lily and Leo. And, uh, you know, who doesn't love a dog video? So uh, have, a, have a great week. Uh, have a great weekend. Uh, I'll be back in town uh, next week. I want to thank everybody in the Baylor community, but particularly this week, uh, the frontline uh, caregivers, our doctors, nurses, our healthcare providers who are actually in the trenches taking care of people every single day, it's getting to be a real slog. I mean, there's just a lot of patients, the ICU numbers going up, you know, it's full protective gear and they take their lives, you know, they're at risk every day they go to work and yet they do it without concern for anything other than their patients. So, a huge shout out, our gratitude to all the Baylor College of Medicine physicians, uh, nurses, PAs, uh, students and residents who are taking care of patients. We really, really uh, respect you and we're all behind you.
Uh, thank you for the great work you're doing. Thank you particularly for what you do for Baylor College of Medicine and our patient community. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend.